Hello, welcome back to another episode of the Nicole Vignola Show. If you're new here, my name is Nicole. I aim to explain the brain to make life feel a little bit less scary. Today, we're going to be talking about three tools to help you deal with burnout. You know that feeling when you're so tired, maybe you don't even realize that you're burnt out. I have a friend that's currently going through a situation where she feels dizzy all the time, and we basically concluded that she's actually very highly stressed and burnt out from a situation in her life. And yet so many people don't understand that when you don't have a lot to give, it's because your central nervous system is incapable of giving more than what it already has. So it's quite literally like you need to replenish that cup. If you're in that place, I'm going to give you tools to help you get out of it and to find compassion for yourself. Because a lot of the time when we're in that place, we constantly feel like we shouldn't be there. We constantly feel like we need to get out of it. And we actually add a whole lot of extra pressure on ourselves. Shame and guilt start coming into play. And that's when things get worse because we don't allow ourselves to fully recover. Life is peaks and troughs. And I find that a lot of the times when we're in a trough, we always fight with ourselves about being back in our peak performance. And so... That adds a whole lot of pressure, which means that we don't really sink into that trough. Now, of course, there's a balance between not letting yourself sink in, but also making sure that we're nurturing ourselves so we can effectively come out of it. So we're going to be talking about three neuroscience-backed tools on how to deal with burnout if you're in this situation. Tool number one is regulate first, solve later. When you are in that state of heightened stress, chronic stress, your brain is perceiving threats from your environment. Now, the problem is that the brain doesn't really know the difference between something that you've thought of and something that you've experienced. And so when you're at home still thinking about that problem, your brain thinks that that threat is still in your environment. Let's use an example as if you were having an argument with a colleague at work. You come home, you're still thinking about it. The brain perceives the colleague to still be there berating you, having a go at you, saying what they said, because you're replaying it in your mind. And the problem is that when we're in that state, it's hard for us to solve the problem because our prefrontal cortex has gone offline, our amygdala and our threat centers are all heightened in a way that basically detect more threat from your environment and you start to catastrophize. You know that feeling when you go down a spiral and it feels like you're never going to get out of it and it just gets worse and worse and worse? That is why. Your brain is essentially prioritizing survival, not clarity. And here's the thing, when you're in that place, the parts of the brain that are responsible for time, for planning, for future planning, all of those things go offline because your brain doesn't even know if it's going to survive another day, let alone make it to the future where you have those plans to make. And so all of those things can feel very overwhelming. And I'm saying this so that if you're in that place, I want you to understand what is going on in your brain. You have to regulate first. You have to tell your brain that there's no immediate threat and then you can solve the puzzle later. So how do we do that? The physiological side is one of the quickest ways and most effective ways to help bring your central nervous system back into a state of parasympathetic tone. What that means is that the stress is being removed from your central nervous system and you can go now into a state of rest and digest. What that basically means is that you're communicating with your brain that there's no immediate threat and you can relax now. Until you've done that, you won't be able to really rationalize with yourself. If you ever had that feeling where you tell somebody to calm down when they're stressed, it doesn't work. That's top-down regulation, trying to talk yourself out of it. That only works if you have effectively done it before in the past. That is essentially the crux of mental resilience, where your brain goes, we already know what this looks like because we've experienced it in a similar manner in another way before and we've overcome it. But when you're in that very heightened sense of stress and it feels like you're not going to get out of it, it is very hard to reason with yourself unless you have that level of mental resilience, which comes later. There are individuals who are able to talk themselves out of it. That is because through life, we gain experience and evidence that we can overcome certain scenarios in our life. So if you've been through something very stressful and overcome it, then the brain understands that it can do it again. But until you've learned the tools to deal with the stress and move through it and gain that mental resilience, then you may struggle to come out of that in a way that is top-down regulatory, where you speak to yourself out of it. Okay, so the way that we do it is we communicate it. So the physiological sigh, inhale through the nose, extra sip at the top, pause for about a second, long exhale through the mouth. I'll do two of them so you can see. So you go. Let's do one more together. feels really good actually. (laughs) Should have done that to begin with. That is essentially saying to your brain, there's no threat, we can relax. Thereafter, you can solve. 
If you try and solve in that place of stress, you're going to catastrophize. If you regulate first and then solve, you'll find that it's much easier for you to find a logical solution-based outcome to the problem. You know that feeling when you're super stressed and it feels like it's getting really bad and you start to spiral and you start to catastrophize? You go for a walk, you do something, you come back and then you're like, oh, actually I know what I can do here. Or actually I know how to solve this. That is not a coincidence. It's because your prefrontal cortex has come back online. Stress has subsided. We can fast track that mechanism by doing the physiological side. Tool number two is that over time, the hippocampus shrivels up for lack of a better term. What this means is that emotional regulation and memory formation can start to become distorted as well. And so what we want to do here is include some kind of tool that can help us recover on a daily basis, on a regular basis. So they've done research where they've essentially looked at individuals who have been stressed. They asked them to sit on the sofa and relax. And then they took another group and they asked them to play Tetris. The group that played Tetris recovered from the stress a lot quicker than the individuals that sat on the sofa. Again, I told you earlier, it's because the brain still perceives the threat to be there. And so your brain still thinks that that thing is in your environment and it struggles to then regulate from it. If there was a lion in your vicinity, you would need the lion to be removed before you could recover from it. You couldn't recover from it with it in the vicinity. There's a threat there that it might kill you. And so what this means is that when we engage in hobbies, things that take our minds completely off the problem for about an hour or however amount of time you spend on a hobby, maybe you play guitar, maybe you actually go into an exercise class, maybe you do arts and crafts, It is no coincidence that when you come out of those situations, you feel a lot better. It is because your brain has not perceived that threat or thought about that thing for the amount of time that you were in that activity. And so if we do this on a regular basis, we're essentially removing the threat from our brain. We're allowing our brain to recover for our hippocampus to quote unquote come back online and plump itself back up eventually over time. But I'm also telling you this because that shriveling shrinkage of the hippocampus can be one of the reasons why emotional regulation can become so difficult. It can feel hard to pull yourself out of that place, but it is not impossible. And with the tools, you start to understand that there is absolutely a way out. Tool number three, something that I want you to first understand before I get into it, is that when you're in a place of burnout, generally speaking, motivation goes down the drain. And what that means is that the little things like brushing your teeth, doing the dishes can feel very difficult. You're not lazy, you're burnt out, you're tired, you're overwhelmed, you have very little resources to give. And so what happens when we do that? We start to berate ourselves. We start to feel like we're worse off. We start to feel like we're a bad person because we're so lazy and I can't even do the dishes. I can't even brush my teeth. And so when we understand what is going on in our brains, we start to find a little bit of compassion for ourselves. And so making sure that you turn that narrative around, tool number three is switching that narrative and congratulating yourself for the small wins. Why? Because every time you congratulate yourself for a small win, you release a little bit of dopamine that makes you feel good. You go, oh, yeah, okay, fine. I am burnt out, but I did manage to brush my teeth today, which I didn't do yesterday. And I managed to do that one thing on my to-do list because the other problem is that we start to look at that to-do list and think there are nine things I didn't do versus, hey, actually, I did that one thing that felt really heavy. And it seems very minimal and it seems silly. It seems so small and minute, but the amount of impact it will have on you in the long run, if you learn to switch that narrative, is going to be huge. The return on investment on that mindset switch is going to give back tenfold, if not more. And that is because shame and guilt, they don't instill change. It doesn't make us feel good and we become stuck in that place. And then that shame and that guilt make us feel even worse, which costs us more energy. So we're giving away more resource to this feeling instead of putting in resources, which is what we need when we're in a place of burnout. If this made you feel seen, then I would love it if you could please like, comment, and subscribe. You'll be helping the channel grow. I make it my mission to try and explain the brain to make life feel a little bit less scary because oftentimes we go through life berating ourselves, hating ourselves, ruminating with ourselves, arguing without fully understanding what is going on. 
when I teach people about the brain and body, they start to see that ah, there's nothing wrong with them. And they'll say, hey, it's not me, it's my brain. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you all next week.